Well, here he is, Jean-Jacques Cornish returns, our returning champion, to tell us more about the continent that we live on, the continent that unfortunately doesn't get nearly the amount of attention that uh, China, Russia, America, and the UK get. But there are reasons for that too, and this is your chance to catch up on all of that stuff. It's brought to you by the Johannesburg Business School right here on the podcast party. And this morning, JJ is on fire to tell us all about all kinds of things, including Chad, Niger, and where the U.S. have decided to host their latest military conference. So, Jean-Jacques Cornish, nice to see you. How are you? Bonjour to you. I'm immensely well, and it's kind of you to ask. <laughs> so, the U.S. can't very well have their military conference in Chad or in Niger or in uh, Libya. Uh, so, where did they decide to have it? Well, not ter not a million miles removed from where we are now, and that is Botswana. You know, there was a time where we thought that the AFRICOM, which was set up some years back, Africa Command, would be in Botswana, that they would give it uh, full-time uh, accommodation. That's never happened. So AFRICOM is still based in Stuttgart. No African country has offered it, uh, has offered to accommodate it. Well, they're now holding the major U.S. military conference. There's at least 40 African countries participating, and it's under the auspices of AFRICOM, led by, of course, General Michael E. Langley, the commander of AFRICOM at this time. And they're going to be talking about terrorism and uh, the, the chiefs of defense of these countries. It's the first time, interestingly, that this uh, Africa Chiefs of Defense Conference is happening on the African continent. It was always in other places. Uh, it's been happening since 2017. And, uh, you know, they'll be talking, as I say, about terrorism, about security. And uh, there are still some American troops in Chad and Niger. They've been shown the door. Uh, but, and, you know, they had a thousand there before. They put a lot of money into putting in uh, drones and putting an airport for the drones that were acting against uh, the jihadis. And uh, th th that hasn't worked. They've been kicked out, essentially. And uh, I've told you in, in, in a previous crossing that uh, the Russians had occupied the bases that, that the Americans had put in. So this is a very big one. I don't know what uh, representation South Africa has at this point, but uh, it's, it's quite a feather in the cap of Botswana that they should be there. Naturally, Kenya, which is... I, has become the United States security partner in Africa, will have yeah. uh, a, a significant presence there. Isn't that nice, though, of the uh, Americans to build all those bases for the Russians to use? I mean, I think that's really kind. I'm sure American taxpayers are thrilled at their expenditure. Well, it's damn sporting of them, I think. And, uh, you, you know, I think their teeth are an edge on this one because, uh, you know, they've got to be very careful in dealing with Africa. They've got to count their words and uh, and, and and obviously count their dollars too. But uh, they are very, very keen to be seen as the presence here uh, against uh, the fundamentalism and, and extremism and the, the people, the go-to people in that regard. So, JJ, I mean, this is this is obviously a sign of what is going on. America's place in the world is changing. And I think many people have started to sniff this. So you could go all the way back to Gore Vidal's end of the empire. Um, I think probably America is going to have less to do with Africa in the next 10 years than it ever has in any decade since probably World War II. But who will take its place? Because... China and Russia seem to be vying for that position. Are there other contenders? Well, uh, Turkey is, is very keen to, to, to play a more prominent role, but certainly the, the two jostling for it would be, uh, and France, of course, once would have seen itself as uh, the, the, they had specialists within the Quai d'Orsay that were called Monsieur L'Afrique, you know, the guy that really knew about Africa. And we did have, uh, I think it was President Giscard telling Thabo and Becky that you don't understand the soul of Africa when we were working on Cote d'Ivoire. So, uh, but the, uh, France has been shown the door. America has been shown the door. Certainly the Russians have tried very, very, very hard. And we've spoken about this foreign minister 
uh, been here many, many times to Africa. Defense minister was here earlier in the month, was in Africa. So they would be the ones. Now, China balks at this a little because they want the commercial uh, uh, ventures in Africa and they want that to be, they, don't, they want their muscle to be commercial rather than military. So I would say who's going to replace America? The one trying the hardest, I would say, would be uh, the Russians. And uh, with Turkey, uh, in terms of peacekeeping and other security operations, playing an increasingly prominent role. I mean, it's fascinating to see how much things are changing and how quickly they're changing. Um, let's just turn our attention to another thing that I think you're probably one of the few people who can tell us about this. And, and you're probably one of the only people in this country who's giving us any idea of what's happening in Uganda. Because apparently a tailor there who dressed Lucky Dube has been jailed for possessing military uniforms. I mean, he wasn't trying to pass himself off as a soldier, was he? Not at all. He is Latif Muloy, uh, and uh, uh, a man who had dreadlocks until he went into prison, uh, and uh, where they cut his dreadlocks off, and he's, he's terribly, terribly upset about that, as would I be if I had dreadlocks. The fact is, what he has done wrong has nothing to do with military uniforms. He has designed the red overalls for, and I know you're going to say the name of a South African politician, not at all. He's designed these red overalls for Bobby Wine. Now, Yaweri Museveni is so scared of Bobby Wine that he locks him up regularly, arrests him, harasses him, because he knows the youth of Uganda have identified with Bobby Wine, and he knows that uh, as political threats arise in his country, Bobby Wine is the top among them. And uh, this man then, being a designer for Bobby Wine, has been arrested. And this is part of the harassment and the, the pretext of uh, having military uniforms, I think, is a lot of nonsense. But again, Yaweri Museveni knows that he can get away with a lot of nonsense if he wants to. It's interesting. Um, Uganda comes up quite a lot as quite a regressive place. Um, you know, we talk about progressive and particularly with a Western lens. Uh, that means all kinds of things. It means free speech. It means uh, free expression. It means gay rights. It means all of that stuff. Of course, we are in a continent where there are a multitude of different opinions about all of these matters. Do you have any particular feeling on which country in Africa may be the most regressive? as opposed to progressive? Well, yes, I do. I think uh, Morocco must be among them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Eritrea still is among them. Ethiopia is a very, very, very tough country to be a journalist in. Rwanda, uh, they have an extremely strong president who uh, an absolutist in his way. And Uganda, I mean, you're wearing Museveni, uh, we had uh, Kiza Bazigia came and spent many years in, in exile in South Africa. He goes back. Uh, he's a threat to Yaweri Museveni. And uh, he then uh, uh, he has been arrested, uh, uh, having gone back to Uganda, having returned home. So it, it, it's, it's tough. Many of these countries I've mentioned, that you're fine if you don't oppose the government. But the moment you step in and try to oppose he who must be obeyed, then you land in serious trouble. I do remember not many that many years ago when Yaweri Museveni was being touted as the opposition to in, in opponent, not opposition, opponent to Madiba as the mm -hmm. premier African leader. And I mean, this was in newspapers like the Sunday Independent. Well, we don't talk about that newspaper now uh, and anything at Prince has having any credibility. But back in the day, uh, I remember pieces in it, and I, to my mind, that it was a particular reporter who was plugging away at it, and um, everything that Yoweri Museveni was up to was being um, uh, was being uh, was being uh, lauded. Uh, he, that's all slipped now, and he's no longer. Uh, I mean, he's a man who's held on for way, way, way too long. Of course, he took over from Idi Amin, you see, and uh, you know. Uh, saved the country from the excesses of Idi Amin, and, and, and he earned kudos for that. But those have all gone now because he is I mean, a truly reported leader. 
I mean, Idi Amin is a very low bar, right? I mean, you don't have to be the world's most progressive or thoughtful leader to beat Idi Amin. Uh, that's that's like uh, that's like the savage banana republic. I think the term banana republic might even come from um, when he was there. Uh, yeah, I'm curious because you know we tend to put such an emphasis on these things, these progressive values in the West. And with America having receded, as we discussed in the first story so far, it's just interesting to me that but not, you know, some of the Republic is, is, is a South American thing. But Idi Amin, if you read Private Eye, he was apparently he caught hold of a young lady and uh, well, he gave her a good seeing to in a loo at, yeah. in an airport. Yeah. And uh, every time the, the, uh, a politician was accused of picadillos in private eye, he, he or she was accused of discussing Ugandan affairs. And that mm. means uh, performing, performing U-turns under the duvet, you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, listen, we've got up. You could take your pick because uh, we, we had uh, in the Central African Republic old, what was his name? Uh, the guy who built the huge replica of... Uh, what so, Notre Dame? Oh, well, well, Bocasa. Yes, yes. Bocassa. Yeah, Jean Vidal Bocasa. Yeah. Wow. I mean, we've got you know we've got some great stories on this continent. So, all right. I'm I'm sad for this man who's you know just trying to design clothing and doesn't seem to be a particular threat. But then, uh, this is what happens in dictatorships that pretend to be democracies. What about Rwanda? We haven't heard a lot about Rwanda, but there's a good news story in Rwanda that's worth... Well, it is. You know, we started speaking about tourism in Africa, and there yes. is now cow tourism in Rwanda. And you want uh -huh. to know how in Rwanda they would say that? It's Ibera Iria Bigogwe. And a man called Ngabo, and he doesn't seem to have a, 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 a surname, uh, during the COVID uh, lockdown, he's was started sharing photographs of his cows on social media and more and more people became interested in everything he had to say about caring for cows what to do now we talked about the countries beautiful countries uganda one of the most beautiful countries in africa and rwanda the Le pays de mille collines the country of a thousand hills is is truly among them too and gabo he now takes tourists to see his cows and he takes them to milk them. This is normally done by women in, in uh, Rwanda because they have a very special touch and a special technique in milking cows. But he teaches all the tourists about this. Uh, of course, they, they uh, what to do with their milk, how to look after them, how to tend to them. Sad to say, he also sells uh, boots, which are clearly made from their hides and hats that are really made from their hides. But this is rural tourism uh and and he has a special technique for that and uh, he's getting something like 20 to 30 tourists a day interested in cow tourism they come from all over the world in rwanda so uh he wants to he complains of only one thing he's very happy about the, this booming business but he doesn't have the capital to build the hotel he reckons he should be able to accommodate the guests better so maybe that's checking for some kind of partnership, uh, a capital partnership in order to expand his business. All right. Well, I like ending on a high note, and that's a very, very nice story. Um, there's obviously still much to be decided in local politics here in South Africa. And um, I'm wondering if you're wondering, because you are the guy who probably pays more attention to all of this than any of us do, do you think there'll be any major changes in our foreign policy with regard to the rest of Africa in a government of national unity, or do you see things being more or less the same? I yeah, There's very little movement in foreign policy, uh, uh, generally speaking, and it's not something that wins or loses elections, and I didn't hear about it at the hustings much, but there no. will be one very big uh, point, and that is Israel. The DA is uh, very strongly supportive of Israel, and as you see, the the ANC is very, very condemnatory. And I mean, they leading the charge at the ICJ. I see uh, Cuba has now joined Brazil and Spain and other countries uh, joining South Africa in its uh, 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 taking. Uh, Israel to the International uh, Court of Justice. 
not the International Criminal Court. They are looking at something as well against Israel. But the ICJ, uh, and uh, uh, so that's going to be something. I don't know if they are what, what they are looking for, but if they get the foreign affairs portfolio, we will see some difference there uh, on, on the, the approach to Israel. And by they, you mean any of the other parties but the ANC? No, I, I, I haven't. Uh, no, certainly as the major uh, second party in the GNU, uh, Israel, um, the DA will make its feelings known on Israel. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, I can't expect you to be Nostradamus. You've already uh, got and uncovered great stories for us this week, and I'm sure there'll be more the next time we see you. Thank you so much, JJ. Always a pleasure to spend time with you and have an excellent week. Thank you. And I have to tell you that I've said this before. I think that as a political forecaster, I make a damn fine fiddle player. <laughs> this is African Analysis, which is brought to you by the Johannesburg Business School with JJ Cornish.